thank you, Papa, for your spirit of revelation and understanding, for your eagerness to reveal yourself and make yourself known. And so we just so ready, Lord, to, to receive what you have to say, to hear your voice. Thank you that you, you don't need any invitation from us to, to, to come and be with us because even when we are in our deepest alienation from you, you are still with us. And you just inviting us to become aware of your closeness. And uh, Lord, that's exactly what we want to do right now. We thank you for this precious moment, this precious opportunity to be aware of your closeness, of your love, of your understanding. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I want to uh, ask a very simple question this morning, and we're going to explore the answer um, in the message, but uh, I want you to really think of this question as I ask it, and um, that is, does God have a clue what it's like to be you? Okay, so just maybe consider that. Push it up a bit. Okay, so let me ask that again. Does God have a clue what it's like to be you? I think that would make a nice Dr. Zeus book. Hey? I've got to do that one day. Uh, you see, we have, uh, when men have philosophized about God, we have described God in the most lofty terms, in the most alien terms. When, when men philosophize about God, we, we start with big words like omnipresence, omniscient, omnipotent. And we, um, from the earliest days, if you, if you go back, even the messages that we went through this weekend and on our website as well, you will understand that religion has its very origin in a concept of distance between us and God. In the idea that there is a gulf between us and Him that is insurpassable. And so whenever men began describing God, it was in terms that emphasized the distance and the delay. Even in the time when Jesus ca came, I mean, two of the most popular uh, philosophies around, you can read about it in Acts 17, Paul was speaking to the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, Epicureanism is basically, um, the idea is that our ultimate goal is to enter into a state of absolute tranquility, a state in which there is no pain, whether of body or of mind. For them, peace meant the absolute absence of every problem, of every anxiety, of every pain. And so, because that is the ultimate state we, we aspire to, their gods, obviously, was in a place of perfect tranquility, and therefore, their gods are far away from you. Because your life is not the absence of contradiction. Your life is not the absence of confrontation and pain. And so you read the beautiful Greek uh, poetry of the gods who sits on their clouds far away observing the earth. And they can observe a, a murder or a marriage, the birth of a child or the beginning of a war. And they are unmoved. They just continue to eat their grapes. And being waved cool because for them to care would mean they would lose their peace. For them to get involved in your life intimately is the end of their tranquility. Now the Stoics took it one point further and they said it's not that God doesn't care, it's God 
cannot care. For them, God was an impersonal intelligence, an impersonal force. And, and so I don't know what is worst news to a, to a hurting heart, a God that doesn't care or God that cannot care. But there's not much good news in that for humanity. And, and so we would think, well, at least, the Jews probably got it a bit more right. Now, when I say the Jews, Israel represented all humanity's religious efforts as well. So I'm, I'm not putting a boundary between us and them, but sometimes we think maybe they had a better understanding of God's closeness. <laughs> you see, Jesus comes, Matthew eleven twenty seven, speaking to the people who's been studying the Torah their whole life, And he says, no one knows the Father except the Son. So despite your thousands of years of Bible study, you're all wrong. Okay, so (laughs) the Jews as well in those days, I mean, we looked at it, you'll you'll get it from the messages before, but the, the problem was not that God was not communicating accurately. The problem was not the software, it was the operating system. The problem is men was interpreting what God was saying through their perverted mindset and therefore put things into the mouth of God and and described God in certain terms that is just plain wrong. That's why you can look in uh, Job 42 verse 7, God comes to speak to Eliapas, one of the, the friends that was conversing with Job, And he says to Eliopas, I'm a bit ticked off at you and your friends because what you have said about me is not true. But how many people will quote any verse out of the book of Job and say, but that is in the Bible? Not realizing that God in the Bible said that there are some things in the Bible that were spoken about him that's not true. (laughs) Okay. Uh, So God comes in the person of Jesus Christ to put an end to our confusion. Hey, if you just read the stories in the scriptures and try and figure out who God is from each story in its own context, you're going to be confused. Because in the one hand, he says, love your enemies. On the other hand, he says, go and wipe them out, smash them against the rocks, rip their children from their bellies. Now, you know what's true? (laughs) Jesus comes to give us the authoritative, the final, the complete vision and word of God. There's a more important question than, is Jesus God? And that is this question. Is God like Jesus? But yeah, because if God is like Jesus, wow, we have got good news. <laughs> if God is like Jesus, then all the confusion is dealt with. And that is exactly what Hebrews 1 says, that God has spoken in various ways and in uh, through in fragments and portions to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken a final word in his son. He is the exact image, uh, the, the exact representation of the character and nature of God. Mm. So, <laughs> Jesus comes in the midst of concepts that puts God at a distance. Now, the Jewish concepts about God as well, although God is busy revealing himself through this nation, developing a language, developing ways of communicating to humanity, they still, in their own fallen mindset, interpret this message wrong. And so one of the the main focuses that the Jewish religion had about uh, uh, in their theology is the holiness of God. And so the holiness of God for them meant his utter separation 
from us. The, the theological term, the transcendence of God. God is completely other. He's beyond time and space, beyond your wildest imagination. He is holy. He is other. Now, when your understanding of holiness is God's otherness, of as that had specific consequences in how they related to God, And one of the consequences is that their doctrines of angels became exaggerated. Because although the Old Testament tells us quite clearly that God gave the law to to Moses, by New Testament times, there's at least two references that says it was actually angels. Because you see, what happened in their theology is it can't be God that directly spoke To a man, I mean, God is completely other, transcendent. It must have been his angel. And so another consequence of that concept of God is he he becomes utterly unapproachable. And he is so other that to see him is to die. This is why Jacob is so... Surprised, I've seen the face of God and yet I live. I mean, this is this is amazing. That is why when Moses says, "Who are you?" and God says, "I am that I am," and he uses the word what we know as Yahweh or Jehovah, Y H V H, and it's not consonants, not. Vowels, it's semi consonants. The Hebrew linguist tells us that they are all the sounds of breathing. And, uh, and when they looked at this word with the mindset of distance, they immediately said, God's name is so holy, it's unpronounceable. Can you see how the mindset of distance? permeated humanity. Now God comes to reveal himself. Because man had thousands of years to try and get to know God through our own cleverness, through our own philosophies, even through our own study of the Torah. And what was the end result? No one knew him. Let me tell you, you won't know God just through the study of the Bible. If you could, stop pretending that Jesus is your Savior. Because the Scriptures can save you. Now Paul tells us that through through him embracing the Torah, all that the Torah did, all that the Scriptures did is revealed to him his flaws and his distance from God and the very thing that was supposed to bring life brought death. And he says, who will deliver me? I need more than my spiritual discipline. I need more than my Bible study. I need more than my own efforts to know God. I need a Savior. And he said, I thank God (laughs) that God has done what we could never do in our own initiative. You see, for you to try and know God, hey, you can go and look at history. The end result of humanity's attempt to know God is our highest philosophy, our best wisdom, our best religion, God said, is foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1. There's only one opportunity. There's only one possibility for us to know God. And that is if God takes the initiative to make himself known. And that is exactly what he comes to do in the person of Jesus Christ. He says, no one knows the Father. No one has ever seen the Father, but the the uniquely born the son who's in the bosom of the Father, he comes to make him known. And what he makes known about God 
is shocking. <laughs> because the word becomes flesh. No one has ever imagined that God could become and take on this human flesh. I mean, it was against the Jewish concepts of God's holiness. It was against the Epicurean and Stoic philosophies about God's distance. But yet God does what none of our cleverest philosophers ever imagined God can do. And he takes on human flesh. He comes and defines himself, defines himself within this one event and this one person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and what he reveals is shocking because he reveals that <laughs> God is not the distant God we've imagined. He surprises us not with how different God is, but he surprises us with how much like us God is. Why is that important? You, you see, likeness is the basis of intimacy. That's why we, when God created Adam in his image and likeness, God was busy enticing Adam into a place of of intimacy. And that's why Adam's not born with full knowledge, because if Adam knew everything, he would have known there is no real alternative. There's only God. Um, that's the only relationship that's going to satisfy. But, but God creates an opportunity for man to fall in love. And so he starts hinting with Adam and he says, Hey, Adam, won't, won't you come and um, help me name the animals? And as Adam names the animals, he starts realizing that any, every animal has got a partner like itself. And that likeness is the basis of a friendship that that animal doesn't have with other animals. And then God increases the volume of his hint. And he takes Eve out of, out of man. And, and man wakes up and he says, now this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. You see, God was still just hinting. He was preparing us for the day in which we would recognize him as flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone. And that recognition of likeness in the person of Jesus Christ becomes the basis of the intimacy that we could never have with our philosophical alienated gods. So Jesus comes to surprise us with a God who's more like us than what we've ever imagined. He comes to surprise us with a God that doesn't avoid your issues and your problems for the sake of protecting his fragile peace. Now this God steps into your flesh. He steps into our arena of conflict and contradiction. <laughs> he reveals that his peace is not so fragile that he needs to avoid you to remain at peace. No, his peace is large enough to embrace you, to embrace all of humanity and remain at peace and bring his peace to you. Even in the midst of your hell, he can bring peace. He reveals a God who's not distant. He reveals a God whose holiness is not his utter separation from you but his complete and utter separation unto you. God has committed himself fully to you. This is why Philippians 3 says, he emptied himself into human form. Hey God, Jesus wasn't just taking a little gamble and say, okay, let's go and see what it's like to be human, but I still want my other life preserved for me, just in case this being human thing doesn't work out. I want to come back 
and be the word, eating my grapes, tranquil, that was in the beginning, without the limitations of human existence. No, God knew long before he designed Adam that he would become a man and remain a man forever. God is still a man in the person of Jesus Christ. And he does not regret his decision. <laughs> Colossians 1.19 does not say it irritated the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. It says it pleased the Father that in him, in this human body, all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell. Colossians 2 verse 9, the Amplified is so beautiful. It says the fullness of the Godhead finds its most complete expression. Where? Where do you think God is more fully God than anywhere else? The fullness of the Godhead finds their most complete expression. Where? In a human body. Woo! Man. <laughs> a human body. <sighs> you see, when, when God becomes man, this is not a temporary commitment. This is not... Uh, an experiment. God becomes a man because he wanted to. Yes. And he designed man for this very purpose that his image and his likeness could find expression for you. When God thought of you, he thought of a way in which he could be uniquely himself. <laughs> And so, Jesus comes to shatter our religious, our philosophical ideas about God. And he reveals a God who is right in the midst of this world with all its thisness, with all its, uh, with all its issues, with all its contradictions. You see, men have legitimately had many questions for God Specific, specifically the philosophical gods that we've, we've imagined. Because, you know, when it comes to the, the question of faith, we could quite legitimately ask, how can a God to whose eyes all things are plain and clear, how can he know what it's like to not know all? How can, how can this God who sees everything, how can he understand a human being like me who mainly sees what's visible? <laughs> has, has he ever lived by faith and not by sight? <laughs> hey, I hope I don't make you nervous with these questions. Many of us have had them and few of us have maybe had the boldness to ask them, but I'm so glad God's really not too, too nervous about our questions. So let's just ask some of these questions and then we hear what he has to say. So we've asked, how, how can a God who is omnipotent, a God who can do whatever he likes to, a God who's all-powerful. How can he have any clue what it's like to be you? A being who, who faces uncertainty. A being who's often in circumstances and situations where the outcome is not clear. I mean, does God really understand how mundane and ordinary this human life can be sometimes? I mean, if you were God, would you spend much time with you? <laughs> Does God really have a clue what it's like to be you? I mean, a God who, uh, to whom nothing is impossible, an immortal God, does he really know what it's like to face death? Uh. You see, 
does, does he really understand what it's like to be here? Because here where we live, there's injustice, there's pain, there's shame, there's conf- confrontation, there, there's all this stuff. Does he have any clue what it's like to be here? <laughs> See, the incarnation is God's answer. The incarnation is the act in which God comes to demonstrate to what extent he has always been one with humanity and understands everything you've ever gone through. There is nothing you have ever experienced that God has not experienced with you. And the incarnation is this demonstration where he steps into our human existence And for the majority of his life, it's just the ordinary, mundane, carpentry life. I mean, he's got to probably travel from job to job. There's only so many tables and chairs to be made in a small community. And when you travel to where a new boat needs to be built or whatever. I mean, when Jesus starts speaking in Matthew 6 and he says... um, Do not worry about your life. Do not be anxious what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. Um, It's not because he had some broadband connection to heavenly poetry that he can just at any time spew out and wow his audience. It's because Jesus, being as fully human as you are, had every opportunity to be anxious and to worry in his life. And maybe traveling from the one job to the another one, he, he realized, I've only got enough money for one more night at the inn, and I don't know where the next job's going to come from. But as he walks and he starts chatting with his father, because he wasn't born omnipotent, uh, or omniscient, if Jesus knew everything, he's not really as human as you and me are. <laughs> Uh, Jesus says, uh, Luke, it says, he grew in wisdom and understanding. So he had to access the mind of his father just like we had to. Maybe in one of those travels, he starts chatting to his dad and he says, Dad, I don't know, what, know what, where the next job's coming from. And his dad says, hey, look at those birds. Look how cheerful they are. And that one found a, a worm. And they then they don't base their confidence or their joy on, on their understanding of the principle of sowing or reaping. They, they just fly around and have at least as much sense as that bird. And know that I care for you. Because you are of much more value to me than that bird. And look at those flowers. I mean, most people don't even see those wild flowers. Yet, look what attention I give it to to color it, to dress it. Hey, quit worrying. Start realizing your value to me. And so you see, it's Jesus not speaking out of his years of study in a monastery, but Jesus living an ordinary human life in conversation with his Father. He saw with eyes of flesh like yours. (laughs) <laughs> like Job asked once in his argument with God, he said in Job 10, have you ever seen with eyes of flesh? Have your days ever been like the days of man? Here Jesus comes and he answers Job. He says, yes, I've seen with eyes of flesh and not always clear. <laughs> but I discovered the faith that allowed me to see the spectacular even in the ordinary, to see the hand of my father in birds and flowers, to see value in the wasted life of a prostitute. You see, we do not live by our own invented faith. We live by the faith of Jesus Christ. So I want to introduce you to the fact to to the reality that Jesus had to live by faith. My righteous one, which was a term used for the Messiah, shall live by faith. (laughs) And this is the faith that we are partakers of. 
And Jesus experienced not just the ordinary human life. He's also experienced the death of loved ones. In, in John 11, he, he goes to the tomb of Lazarus and, and he doesn't just observe Mary and Martha crying. He cries with them. But I'm so glad that, that this God doesn't just empathize and feels with us. He also has something more to offer. Resurrection life. He has an answer to the struggle and the torment and the pain we go through. And, and so he doesn't just leave them at that place of, of confusion and, and pain, but he, he raises Lazarus. I want to get back to that, but let's, I, wa- I want to take it further. I want to take it all the way to the cross. Because you see, the cross is the place where he identifies with us in our deepest level of alienation from God. This is the place where, where Jesus, as a fully man, takes upon himself the mindset of fallen humanity. And on our behalf, he cries out what fallen humanity has been thinking and asking. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, the cross is the moment in which the immortal God is facing death. The cross is the, I know it's a contradiction, but that's what the cross is, a big contradiction. (laughs) The cross is the moment in which God himself experiences what it is like to feel God forsaken. And so on our behalf, he cries out what fallen humanity is feeling. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because it sure looks like it. I mean, the skies are darkened. I'm beaten to a pulp, in pain, dying. I mean, if God's love and presence with me is dependent on me feeling good and being in a comfortable situation, then the cross should be the undoubtable proof that God has forsaken His Son. No, he did not. Because just after he asks the question, have you forsaken me on humanity's behalf, he answers us by entering our hell for us. God declares, I will rather go to hell than forsake you. If you continue to read in Psalms 22... Now, obviously, Jesus could only, I mean, on a cross, it is difficult to even breathe. So he gets out the first word, Psalms 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He continues to recite the psalm. I have trusted on you from my, from my mother's breast. I've, you have never forsaken us. He comes to verse 23 and verse 24, where the truth is revealed, and the truth is this. God has never forsaken the afflicted, nor has he turned his face from us. You see, the, the, the theory of atonement that tells us that this is the place where God forsook his son, turned his face from him, It's just a continuation of the pagan mythical ideas we've had about God all along. That God needs to exert his bloodlust, needs to forsake us, needs to make sure that we pay the full penalty of our sin before he's enabled to forgive. Now the cross is the event in which God reveals. Because Jesus is never separated. He never becomes less than God. He's fully God. This is the place where God reveals even when you are at your worst. While you are nailing me to that cross, he prays, Father, forgive them. 
He reveals the heart of God, and the heart of God is, He is always good, no matter how bad we get. He is always for you, always inviting, always loving, always forgiving. And so the event of the cross is where He enters into our deepest alienation from God. Why would He do this? I love what some of the early church fathers like Athanasius and these guys have said. They they said that God's method of salvation, God's process of salvation, is to become whatever he wants to save. In other words, they did not see the salvation of humanity as a legal transaction that just happened at the cross, that somehow there was a payment there that brought about our salvation. They, they saw the very act of the incarnation, this act in which God binds himself to humanity, as the beginning of our salvation. Because God becomes what he wants to save. And it is in his act of becoming what he wants to save, but he saves us. In other words, he becomes us in every situation, in in every circumstance that we find ourselves. He comes to demonstrate the depth of his identification with us. And so the cross, obviously, is the culmination. It's the conclusion of this... um, This identification, this is the place where God knows us, even in our deepest hell. See, Ephesians 4 says, For this purpose he descended and ascended, that he may fill all things. Now, the way in how we want to read that in the Western world is, there was a time... You know, in our Western mindset of three-dimensional space and time, uh, as maybe an added dimension or added concept, in that concept we want to say, "Mm, what that scripture means is that a few thousand years ago, Jesus went to a place called hell, did whatever he needed to do there, got the keys, and when he left, and now he is in heaven, um, uh, getting ready to do something new. That's not what that scripture says. That scripture says he descended and ascended so that he may fill all things. Now, on the, on the authority of that scripture, I can boldly say that God is still in hell. What does that mean? It means that no matter what torment, no matter what suffering I find a person in, I don't even have to try and pull them out of that hell to introduce them to God. I can introduce them to the God who has been in their hell with them. The God who understands them better than what they understand themselves. The God who has experienced everything they have experienced with them. This is the God who knows you. Hey, do you have a clue how well God knows you? Do you have a clue? how intimately he has united himself with your existence. Because when he emptied himself into human form, he burned all his bridges. (laughs) This wasn't a temporary commitment. You see, the good news is not that one day you can go to heaven and avoid hell. The good news is that he saw such value in your life that he left heaven to come to you. And now heaven is wherever Christ is. And the mystery revealed is Christ in you. (laughs) And when you start recognizing Christ in others, your heaven expands exponentially. 
Now, I'm, the, I'm not here to do a teaching on heaven or those kind of things, but obviously I, I, I've got no problem with conceiving of dimensions and experience way beyond our wildest imaginations. But if you think heaven is just some beautiful colors and another place, you've missed what heaven is all about. John 14 verse 20 is what heaven's all about. In that day you will know that I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I'm in you. That's heaven. That's the place he went to prepare for us. A place of awareness. <laughs> and that heaven can start right now. <laughs> you see, the cross is the place where, where God comes to convince us that there is no depth to which you can sink, that I will not sink with you. There is no path you can walk that I will not follow you. No, not all paths lead to God, but there is not one path that God will not walk to get you, <laughs> to find you, <laughs> and to bring you back again to a Father who has always been for you, a Father who has always been with you, a God who has never been your problem. He has always been your salvation. So the, the conclusion of today's message is that does God have a clue what it's like to be you? Oh, the incarnation is God's answer. See, the incarnation is not the first time that God experiences what it's like to be human. It's not like Jesus, the Father said, you know, all this discipline in the Old Testament doesn't seem to work. Let's go and see Let's try something else. Let's go and try and be nice and see if that works with him. And, and, and Jesus comes, he's a human, and he goes back and he says, this human thing's a bit harder than what I thought. Maybe we should be nicer to them and we call it grace. <laughs> see if that works for a few thousand years, then we'll revert back to the other methods again. Um, no, the, the incarnation is is God's demonstration of how intimately he has been connected to every human life always. Because Colossians 1.17, speaking about Jesus, says, He is before all things. Now, who is Jesus? Jesus is the perfect union of God and man. Jesus, the incarnation, is God's declaration. I do not want to be God by myself with myself or for myself. The only way in which I want to be God is with man, for man, and as a man. But Jesus is also fully human. And so therefore his declaration as the perfect man is, I don't want to be a man by myself, for myself, with myself. The only way in which I want to be human <laughs> is a man with God for God and in union with God because that's the only way in which you can fully be yourself in union with Him. And so this union of God and man which was before all things and in Him all things consists. In other words, from the beginning of time there has not been one human experience that God has not experienced with that person. He comes to shatter our illusions of a God who's somewhere else at a distance. You see, religion relies on the lies of distance and delay. God somewhere else or some other time. Jesus comes to reveal a God who is Emmanuel, a God with us, the God who is I am. The only time frame in which you can experience him is now. He's not I used to be or I will be. He's I am. <laughs> He's all about your very present life. You see, the event of the cross, uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 says, 
God saved us according to His own grace. He gave, he gave us grace not, uh, and saved us not according to your good works, but according to His own purpose. When? Before time began. Wow. It seems like God made up His mind about you before you had any opportunity to disappoint Him or to impress Him. He does all of this. Before time began, verse 10, <coughs> but now it has appeared in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the, the event of the incarnation is simply an appearing of an event that occurred within eternity, beyond time and space, and therefore it is an event like none other. Let me, let me say this another way. How much of your past still exists? The past does not exist anymore. Time is insubstantial. The future doesn't exist yet. And so for many, therefore, the, the only thing that exists is the moment, the, the now. But how big is the present? Is it a day? Is it an hour? Is it a second? If you, if you deconstruct it, analyze it, basically... The present is simply the movement from a past that no longer exists into a future that does not exist yet. So time by itself is very insubstantial. So when you get down to it, the only place where your past still exists is in your memory. The gospel comes to offer you an alternative memory. The gospel comes to declare to you what really happened to you. The gospel comes to redeem even your time. Your past doesn't have to be just the memory of regrets and sorrow. God wants to, wants to link your past to the history of your salvation. He wants to convince you. But the, de the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, the story of Jesus, is your story. That is the only event in your past that in reality still exists. <laughs> you see, it's the cross in which God reveals that evil does not have the final word in your life. This is where he summarizes your whole life. And he says all the injustice, all the violence, all the pain, there's something beyond it. There's resurrection life. Your future does not have to be bound to a regrettable past. When you discover the history of your salvation. <laughs> you see, so many people find themselves in a place where they feel trapped in time. An unchangeable past, the inescapable present and, and the doomed future. Future that's doomed to repeat the, the mistakes of the past. And, and so for them, religion is the promise of escaping time. God's eternity is much more than escaping time. His eternity wants to invade your time and come and do the impossible. Change your past. So that you know that the only thing that is still real about your past is that when He died, I died. And when He was raised, I was raised together with Him. And being seated in heavenly places together with him in blameless innocence is the only reality in my past that God remembers. Because Hebrews 10, 17 says that God has done such a perfect work in, in Christ that he remembers your sin no more. There is not one thought in the mind of God concerning you that reminds him of sin. <laughs> See, the reason you can have a clean conscience is because God has cleansed His own conscience. He will think of your sin no more. 
Now, if the only part, if the only past that exists is the past that's in your mind, the only real past that exists is the past that God is aware of. If something does not exist in the mind of God, it does not exist at all. And God says, I've got no awareness of any distance, of any reason for shame, for guilt, for distance. (laughs) I've got only one reference for our relationship. And that is that I have embraced humanity when they were at their worst. When you were at enmity against me. That's when I knew you in my most tenderest love. I took the opportunity of your most brutal violence to reveal my heart of love to you. (laughs) This God is just for you. Do you have a clue how well God knows you? He knows you. He understands you. And his invitation is for you to know, even as you have always been known. God has never been confused about you. He has always known you for who you really are. His image and his likeness, his opportunity to live and move upon this planet. I'm going to close with a last phrase. We started off by saying that in our philosophical ideas about God, we, we start off with terms like omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. But, and you know, God displayed, God is all of those things, and God displayed his omnipotence uh, in the Old Testament. But, but what was the result? No one knew him. <laughs> because you can't be intimate with aliens. You can fear him, but you can't love him. And so Jesus comes, and it says he lays aside his divine privileges. How is it possible for God to become a man and not cease to be God? I think God starts revealing something to Paul in Corinthians, is it first or second Corinthians 13, where he speaks about love. And he says, um, Paul, I want, I want to teach you something about love. Now remember, God is love. And he says, um, you know, I know you guys are very impressed with omnipotence, but if I have the power, all the power to move mountains... And do anything like that, but I have not love, I am nothing. What is God saying to Paul concerning himself? God's revealing to Paul, you know, Paul, it is not my omnipotence that makes me me. And if I could speak the language of angels and know all things, but I have not love, I am nothing. Paul, I, I know you guys are very impressed with Omniscience, but let me break the news for you. It is not my omniscience that makes me me. You see, what God is in essence, in core, is God is love. And this is why it was possible for God to become a man and not cease to be God because the human existence is in no way a limitation for the love of God to be revealed. That's why God is so excited about your life. You don't have to know all things, be all powerful, or be present anywhere, everywhere, to be a vessel used by God. No, if you have an opportunity to love, God has an opportunity to be himself in you. And I can guarantee you, no matter where you are, what circumstances you find yourself in, you have an opportunity to love. Glory!
<laughs> Papa, we thank you for having come and united, demonstrated your, your unity with us. We thank you that you have known us even while we were in, at enmity against you. But you did not allow our thoughts or our deeds to confuse you about who we are. We thank you that even though we've deceived ourselves, you've never been deceived. And you've continued to hear the echo of your own image and likeness within man. We thank you that you've come through the declaration of the gospel this morning to seal within our faith and within our experience what has always been true. That you have always loved us, you love us, and you will always love us. Thank you, Papa.